G'day, welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad. Today we are joined around the bar table by Dr. Andrew Swafford, who is the Associate Professor of Theology at Benedictine College in Kansas. We are going to talk about sacred scripture, uh, the Bible timeline, how you and I can begin to love scripture more. If you're like me, you're someone who knows that you should love scripture. Maybe you have a desire to love scripture, but maybe you struggle to read it regularly, struggle to understand it. That's what this episode is going to be all about. So buckle up. It's going to be fantastic. Hey, do you see this candle? Mm. Sometimes I just like to smell it. Eases the nerves and things like this. This candle is created by a friend of mine. Her name is Elisa McLaughlin, and her candles are absolutely the best, and I want you to go buy them. So here's what I want you to do. Go to trulykindred.com to check them out. You can use Matt Frad, one word, to get 10% off. I'm not just saying this to sell her candle because she's an advertiser, okay? I actually mean it. I swear to God that these are the best uh, smelling candles I've ever come across. Um, They're not cheap smelling. They're not artificial. They're just really beautiful. Elisa is a homeschooling mum of five. She's a beautiful Christian, so you could be supporting her work as as well. So go to trulykindred.com. Truly Kindred Candles are hand poured in the Pacific Northwest by Elisa McLaughlin. Pacific Northwest sounds so cool. I don't know what would be like, <laughs> you can't have, you can't have like fancy candles poured in the South, maybe. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they are inspired by the wilds of southern Washington. That's why. Truly kindred candles are made in small batches by hand and are made with the highest quality, quality ingredients. Elisa loves expressing her deep love for God and all the beauty he created through different artistic mediums. The majority of her time is spent raising and home educating her five children and and, uh, and adventuring with her husband, Chester. So please do me a favor and check this out. I buy these candles whenever I'm done with them. She actually sent us these ones for free, but we actually buy them as well. Best smelling candles you will ever find. Again, Again, go to trulykindred.com and use Matt Frad, one word in the promo box thingy, to get 10% off. All right. Second thing I want to tell you about is covenant eyes. If you don't have covenant eyes, you should seriously consider getting covenant eyes. Maybe you're a single person who struggles with pornography, or maybe you're just tired of having pop-ups for porn show up on your uh, internet. But if you have children, I think you need to get covenant eyes. That thing that our Lord said about if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better if a great millstone were tied around your neck and you be thrown into the depths of the sea. I always think about that when I think of parents who give their children devices and who do not appropriately lock them down. Please get Covenant Eyes. It's the best filtering and accountability software on the web. Really easy to get it to sign up. Uh, Filtering blocks the bad stuff. Accountability, it'll give you a report if your children go somewhere that they shouldn't or if you're the person struggling with pornography, your accountability partner will get an email telling them if you've gone somewhere you shouldn't. So that it puts you in relationship with another person who can love you and invite you to live a more beautiful life. Go to covenanteyes.com to learn more. Covenanteyes.com and in the promo code use Matt Frad, one word, and that'll give you one month for free. So you can try Covenant Eyes, the whole thing, 100% free on all your devices. And then if you don't like it, you can not pay a cent. I don't think that'll be the case. We have it on all of our devices and we don't let our children play at people's houses unless they have this stuff locked down. It really is that serious. Do the responsible thing. Go to covenanteyes.com today and in the promo code, use Matt Frad. It'll get you a month for free. All right, here is my interview with Dr. Andrew Swafford. Finish your sentence and then cut, and then we'll just stitch it together. Dr. Andrew Swafford, how's it going? Hey, it's great to be here with you, Matt. Thanks for having me. (laughs) That sounded super professional. You got that great American voice. I'm like, Dr. Swafford, good to be with you, man. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well, mate. Do you remember that I went to the Philippines with Sarah Swafford, your darling wife? I do. She had a great time with you. When I first met her... That I remember thinking there's no way this woman is for real because she's just so friendly and bubbly and lovely. You and me both. Did you think that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were friends for a while, but uh, oh, yeah. And so, but then after like however many hours it takes to fly to the Philippines, I'm like, no, she's like that all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, she's great to have on your side. She can be a great cheerleader. Yeah. Well, it's really great to have you on the show. We've met just a handful of times um, and I've seen some of the work you've been doing on uh, the Great Adventure Bible stuff. That's what you call it, right? 
<laughs> That's the name of it. And uh, it's, I've been really impressed. And so I'm, I'm really excited to, to have you on the show. Tell our listeners a bit about yourself and me. Yeah, no, it's, it's really great to be here. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I hail from uh, Dayton, Ohio, and uh, I uh, grew up Catholic, but kind of a name only and um, didn't necessarily mean a whole lot and went to uh, play small college football and just had a big conversion at Benedictine College, I which heard is about that, yeah. where I teach now. Uh, but uh, never dreamed I'd be where I am now. And um, I, On points with Aquinas? Yeah, Dr. Shri. Oh, yeah, that too. Uh, so he, he taught there for nine years and kind of just changed my life. And I went into this to kind of do what he did uh, for me, for others. So. so tell us about that, how Dr. Shri changed your life, because I've heard a little bit about it. Yeah, you know, I just had never had a man proclaim the gospel with conviction and confidence like that before. And, I, you know, I learned more frankly, in a semester with him that I did 12 years Catholic education. Uh, it, it just it was over time. It was focused. It was different, a different group of friends, but, uh, that, that kind of confident conviction proclamation of the gospel, um, it was powerful. So were you playing football at Benedictine college? At the yeah, time? no, I was, I was. And, uh, and that hasn't always been a, correct me if I'm wrong, but that hasn't always been like a stellar Catholic institution. Oh, no, no, no. And, and I mean, in fact, and, and I think, uh, it, it really, there were seeds planted before us, but it kind of really turned while Sarah and I were there, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, no, it, uh, it's got a long history, but no, it, it really has reclaimed its Catholic identity in, in powerful ways. And, and the school's enrollment is more than doubled the size of the school that we went to. Uh, and it, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I kind of did well. I made the travel team my freshman year, playoff squad my freshman year. Kind of think you had everything you want, but you know that there's something missing, right? There's just, there's just you know, when, you're, when your happiness, your joy is dictated by your times, your weights, your playing time, et cetera, um, there's something off. And then I huh. we played an exhibition game in Paris, France my freshman year, wow. in May after the season got out. And uh, This is NFL football? No. <laughs> not NFL football. I mean, American football. American Not rugby. <laughs> that's the distinction I was trying to make. Sorry. That, that's exactly right. It's yeah. not XFL either. What's that? Oh, this new... Uh, alternative, uh, you know, know, guys who aren't quite NFL, but yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So American football, <laughs> yep. uh, I broke my fibula in the game over there. And, and for me, my world was just crazy. I didn't even want to go at the time. I wanted to get back home to train. Where, where's um, your fibula? Where, where's this? Uh, lower calf, calf, you know, so not, not, not the big your femur. Sh- not my femur, no. my fibula. Uh. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, it's, so for me at the time, I just went to a depression. My world, my identity was kind of gone. And, uh, I ended up redshirting that next season because I didn't want to waste a year of eligibility not having trained all summer. Um, and then I, Dr. Shree and I had, be, uh, had had him for two classes and I had declared a theology major, but not for good reasons. I was just kind of intrigued intellectually, but it cool. hadn't gone from the head to the heart. And that summer is kind of going head to the heart. Um, we went out to lunch and I was firing questions on left and right. And uh, he's like, and I'm teaching this class called Christian Moral Life. It's full, but it sounds like from your questions to be up your alley. If you'd like, I'll let you in. And well, so forgive yeah. me, where is this? In, in Benedictine or? Benedictine College. Yes. He's student. teaching there. He's the teaching time. there. Okay. Yeah, he taught there for nine years. And uh, I don't know how to say it, but that class changed my life. Right? You know, walk in wow. and think it's about Bible says this, can't do this, church says that. It's, you know, freedom, virtue, happiness, friendship. All the, it's all that I saw intellectually. This is why you're not happy because you're made for more. And then, uh, you know, got involved with focused Bible study. And uh, I remember being in my dorm room <clears throat> in my sophomore year, October. And I remember I was in a relationship with a girl back at Ohio University. And uh, good girl though she was, it was clear this is the last thing that was kind of keeping me back from the life mm-hmm. I wanted to live. Try not to bang on the table. Yeah, and, and um, I remember praying in my dorm room almost audibly um, saying, it, do you want me to leave this relationship? And I remember almost saying to myself uh, and almost saying out loud, no matter what you say, I'm not going to do it. And I can't explain it, but two months later, going for Christmas break, I just knew inexorably this was the last thing holding you back. And uh, for her sake and for mine, walked away. And uh, it was like gas on a fire after that. You just couldn't couldn't shut me up. And then then Sarah transferred in the following fall. So it was really kind of powerful that uh, I felt like the Lord prepared me to meet her. She didn't have to worry if, uh, is my conversion about her? Is it legit? Is it sincere? Because it happened before I met her. Uh, And then the rest is history. So were you quite popular being the football guy? I mean, it, it, where Benedictine was at the time, it it caught some waves because no one yeah, really, you, I mean. you had the kind of the God squad, Bible beaters, and you had the athletes, yeah. the jocks and the party crowd, and no one really uh, darkened each other's doorways. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a powerful, um, that's really, you know, not to, I mean, not to be, bold, but it, it was, it caught people's attention yeah. and we were able to kind of build some bridges. We had a, a football non-denominational Bible study for a while. And, and we, we had a lot of kind of evangelical efforts, uh, just trying to kind of bring people out of the party crowd. And, and you uh, said focus was on the campus at the focus time? Focus began at Benedictine College. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, it was part of Dr. Shri and Focus all began together late 90s. Wow. Uh, we rolled up. I was there uh, August 2000 as a freshman. Oh, so, okay. So when did you have your conversion? What year was that? 
So uh, it was the height of it was like 9 11. Uh, oh, so that, I was in, it was in Dr. Street's Christian Moral Life class at the time when yeah. that happened. And then that Christmas break is when I left that relationship. Sarah transfers in the, the following fall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was in 2000 at Rome, World Youth Day. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, just yeah, a couple yeah, of years. Look, look, the That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And so, but then you went on to get a doctorate in what? And how did that, how did that go? Well, you know, with, um, you know, part of my, uh, so the conversion with Dr. Shree's moral life class was powerful, but also one thing he did for me is he connected Jesus with the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause it's easy to be like, I love Jesus, get the church thing away from me. Right. And, and so salvation history was kind of really the, some of the seeds of my conversion and he inculcated a great love of scripture for me. And, and I, I, you know, back then with Benedict and, um, you know, he had like three theology professors right now we have 10, right? I mean, I, I was able to take seminars with him as a sophomore and as a junior, I mean, you can't get in those classes now cause it's too full. Um, so uh, on his own counsel, I went to uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School to mm. do a master's in Old Testament and Semitic languages. Uh, so I was the only Catholic in the program. I, and it was, they were, you know, uh, I was, you know, lived in a dorm with these guys and half of oh. them are kind of PhD bound, half of them are kind of pastor bound. And it was, it was awesome. I mean, I did Hebrew there, did Aramaic there, did Greek there, did a lot of archaeology and history and stuff like that. Um, and so I... Uh, and how, how, I mean, obviously you were very bored into the Catholic faith at this yeah. point, oh, yeah, yeah. but what was it like being with these other kind of intellectual Christians talking about Catholicism versus evangelicalism? <sighs> well, you know, I, one story, so uh, good, my best friend from that time, his name's James Merrick, who's now writing for Ascension's uh, blog, actually. Mm-hmm. So at the time we went round around for hours and hours. We bonded over N.T. Wright, a shared love mm-hmm. of N.T. Wright. We had a class with Kevin Van Hooser together, who's kind of like a kind of like an evangelical Bishop Barron. I mean, at the time it was kind of a, a up and coming. And um, so we, we, we spent hours and hours and hours and uh, I walked away from that thinking, I just didn't say the right things. Hey, we were friends, but he, he, you know, he, he would defend me to the Protestants. He would, he would, he rejected soul scripture, huh. but I couldn't quite bring him all the way. Uh, we lost touch for about uh, five, six years. He went off and did a doctorate at Aberdeen in Scotland um, on Karl Barth, became an Anglican priest for 10 years. And then we got back in touch and he's like, you know, those conversations really impacted me. And he became a Benedictine oblate two summers ago. What? He brought his entire family into the church, became Catholic at the time because of that lost his minister's visa had to leave Scotland, had to come back to the States from the States, but he had to leave the States. I mean, really his, his, um, you know, ecclesial career was seemingly over his academic career, didn't know where to go. Uh, so that was a great example for me of, of someone who we went round and round. And sometimes you think you say the right just thing, a bit, bit closer to the okay. mic. Yeah. Sometimes you think you say the perfect thing, right? Yeah. They're going to fall like a deck of cards. Totally. The Holy yeah. Spirit just yeah. humbles you. And sometimes you think you just screwed it up. Yes. And the Holy Spirit surprises you. He's a great example for me of a, of a conversion that took years. I mean, years to mature and blossom. Uh, but now he's a powerful, we teach him at a Catholic high school. He's working with Scott Hahn. He's writing for Ascension. He's gonna really? he's got a book deal for ascension press right now what's his name uh james merrick and where um, does he teach uh it's a high school in pennsylvania okay. uh he's been working for the saint paul center as well with wow. scott Hahn. and uh, so that was so through three i got linked to han and, and when james was converting i i, I wrote to, to scott and i said here's a guy who's got a similar background as you he's yeah. got some of the same intellectual heroes as you and just kind of just so let's just see what happens and uh and scott i mean really incredibly generous um brought James on for a year at the St. Paul Center, wanted to help kind of give him a Catholic formation, give him Catholic street cred. And that's what gave him the, got him the uh, high school teaching job. He was also mm-hmm. adjunct at a Franciscan at the time. Uh, and now I think he's going to return with Scott. So, I mean, it's, it's been great to see these worlds collide because James was reading Scott. He read, he read the catechism when we were at Trinity. He read Scott's dissertation. He was reading everything. And now it just, like I said, it just took time to develop. So I love being there. Um, I, I did start to see, initially my plan was to go PhD Old Testament. I also kind of saw uh, some of our disagreements are not just about grammar and syntax, and I kind of want to have more robust kind of theology and philosophy. So that's when I went from there and did my doctorate at Mundelein, uh, where it was so like Father Bishop Barron was just a priest at the time, just a professor. Mm-hmm. Father Barron did my dissertation under Father Edward Oakes. The, the schools are about 20 minutes apart. So I was at a Protestant seminary and then a Catholic seminary. Jeez. And it kind of, you know, I, I, I mean, for me, my great love, uh, so I wrote on nature and grace and you know, Aquinas and to, to go from Aquinas' metaphysics to ancient Hebrew and back and forth. And, and to see that the Jewish Jesus is the divine Jesus, that the fulfillment of the story of Israel 
is fulfilled in the church and in, in, in you know, another uh, uh, friend of mine I see every year at a conference, Brant Petrie. Yeah. Uh, and he, we just I just finished his uh, Jesus and Last Supper with uh, a group of students at a seminar I'm teaching, and he talks about the Eucharistic restoration of all Israel. I mean, it's, it's he's taken the NT Wright project so much further, so much deeper. So Dr. Shree planted those seeds a long time ago. Love for NT Wright, love for salvation history, uh, and it's it's. It, but I also had a great philosophy mentor at Benedict and uh, named Dr. Rio, and he's a TAC grad. Just kind of gave me that kind of pure Thomism. Uh, uh, and so for me, those worlds kind of collided then and continue to collide. And, and it's just been, it's just been powerful. You know, I mean, I, I joke, I'm like, I'm, I'm just trying to be the ass upon which our Lord rides to Jerusalem. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. G'day. Just want to take a pause from this interview and tell you about Hallo, which is a fantastic app that will help you to pray, teach you to pray, especially during this Lenten season. You've been wanting to grow more in your prayer life. Hallo can help you do that. It's a fantastic app that leads you in different prayer experiences like Lexio Divina, uh, where you have scripture read to you. Uh, by a lovely voice and you have like Gregorian chant in the background, synth music, you can choose. You can do examinations of conscience. It'll help you pray the rosary. It's incredibly professional, like really professional. Because you know how there are those apps and they're kind of new agey and you want to use them because it kind of calms you down. This one, you don't have to worry about the new age stuff. It's 100% Catholic and it's super great. Hallow offers a permanently free version of their app, which includes content that's updated every day, as well as a paid subscription option with premium content. But by using the promo code MATTFRAD, one word, you can use, sorry, you can try out all the sessions in the app for a full month, totally for free. So to take advantage of this special offer, here's what I want you to do. Go to Hallow, that's H-A-L-L-O-W dot A-P-P slash MATTFRAD. Check it out right now. Hallow dot app slash Matt Fred and create your account online before downloading the app. That's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot there that you just threw out that I want to dive into all of it. Um, maybe why don't we begin with, you talked about the Jewish Jesus. You've talked about kind of understanding the Bible in a holistic way because I would imagine that the vast majority, the vast majority of cr- cr- Christians don't look at the Bible that way. Yeah. I probably don't look at that way as much as I should. Um, so maybe talk about that because I know that you were responsible in great part for the, what's it called, the Bible, oh, sorry, Great Adventure Bible Timeline. Yeah, the Great Adventure Bible Timeline came out uh, two Septembers ago. And that, that's, so it's, you know, Jeff Cavins, uh-huh. Bible Timeline, teaching the Bible in a way that uh, you get the overarching story and then understand everything in light of that. Just an incredible gifted Bible teacher. I uh, was part of that with... Uh, putting that into a Bible with Mary Healy, um, mm-hmm. Peter Williamson, and then Jeff Cavins and myself. And then uh, this is this, beautiful. This is it. Um, and it's got- Ascension the, did a great job. Well, it's got the timelines in there. It's got lots of maps. It's got all Jesus' words in red. I, Should I, you I, teach out of this? I, is this your personal Bible? I, well, wow, I, you read the Bible a lot. So, well, I, I, it's like faded jeans. You can buy it that way, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, so I, I, totally I, I usually idea. teach out of other Bibles, but this is the one that I assign for the students because having the essays and having all the kind of, it, it's taken away the need to have other books to do that work for me. So, um, that's awesome. But, uh, but yeah, so doing, doing that, uh, and doing Bible studies, um, with Ascension. So we just did Romans, uh, yeah. it's an eight DVD series. Um, they just came out last September, uh, Jeff Cavins and myself. Uh, I, you know, I, one of the most exciting moments in Bible scholarship in the last 30, 40 years is an insistence on situating Jesus in his Jewish, first century Jewish context and situating Paul likewise in his first century Jewish context. Okay, can we yeah. break that open then? So yeah, what yeah. does it mean to see Jesus in yeah, his well, first I mean, century Jewish context and maybe yeah. ha- maybe begin with how we just view him well, and why that's problematic? I mean, so um, it's, it's, there's a couple different, I guess, ways we could dive in and layers to it. But um, the, let's start with this, the cynic Jesus, the hippie Jesus, the just be nice to everybody. I mean, this is for me, my conversion, like the just be nice gospel. I mean, Confucius could have taught me that Plato could have taught me that. What difference does Jesus make? Um, the just be nice Jesus, the hippie Jesus, he doesn't get crucified. Historically speaking, that makes no sense at all. Unless you've got a really low view of the Jews, the ancient Jews, that they would just crucify someone for saying to love people. Uh, That's frankly historical nonsense. Uh, So I think even at an apologetic level, the kind of sometimes our kind of, um, you know, revisionist views of Jesus, like they actually have to make sense in in light of Jesus' first century Palestinian context. So um, 
The only way Jesus gets crucified is because he catches the attention of the authorities, both Jewish and Roman. And that, that's only going to happen because he's perceived as politically and religiously subversive. Um, it's not because it would, it would not have been subversive or interesting or exciting or even thought provoking to say, Hey, love people because, mm-hmm. uh, love your neighbors yourself. That's in Leviticus 19. That's not actually mm-hmm. new. Right. Um, so I, I think when, uh, for me and the projects that I'm excited, uh, to be involved in, um, one, I think it's, it's done a lot to restore confidence in the historical Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because, um, the, the gospel writers themselves, it's all laced with the first century Jewish context, whether it's, um, political debates, Sadducees, Pharisees, the geography, this is all about the, the humanity of the incarnation, right? The, the human, the, God didn't drop down a platonic philosophy. He didn't drop down an idea. He became one of us. He encountered mm-hmm. us in space and time. And that's why it's not like middle earth. I mean, going to the Holy Land, doing pilgrimages over there, you, th- these things happened in places you can go to to this day. I mean, where, where did Zeus live, right? Where did Osiris live? Where, where are the missionaries of Osiris? From the beginning, you got missionaries of Christianity, missionaries of Jesus. Um, so, and then when you kind of, you've got the biblical story, the story of the rise and fall of the Davidic kingdom, which we could get into more, but then the kind of second temple context. So the, the Jewish writings that are contemporaneous with the, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you've got a, a number of things that have really opened our eyes uh, to this Jewish context. And what I love showing students is how Jesus taps into and transcends that Jewish context. That these things are intelligible in Jesus' day, but they're not exhausted by Jesus' time period. In other words, you can't explain Jesus merely as a product of his own day, historically, but what he says and does, does make sense, does register. And my conviction is, when you have the sense for the context, it registers even more profoundly. So it's not as if you, you never want to bury the meaning to the there and then, uh, but if you have an appreciation for how it would have sounded to a first century mm-hmm. Jew, it redounds all the more loudly. Hmm. Now, from the early church, you have heretics like Marcion and Mm -hmm. others, and even today you have some people who want to throw out the Old Testament and edit the New Testament. Yeah. Um, Talk about that. Why is that a problem? You know, it's funny, Bishop Barron, when he first launched the Word on Fire project into those YouTube videos, one of his first ones that became pretty popular was the four YouTube heresies, Uh, the the things that kind of he he saw, and one of them was Marcionism, that this kind of uh, Old Testament, how how do I deal with this angry God and all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, I I mean, there there are some difficult passages, right? So I, I, I think uh, a couple things that I impress upon my students. One, the gradualness of revelation. It's not all monolithic, right? It climaxes in Jesus. It's a story that's moving toward a goal, right? So to, to hmm. you can't read every page of it as if it's on the same plane. It's moving. It has to be, all be read in light of Christ crucified. So there's a gradualness to it. Hmm. In fact, the Catechism, Catechism 122, speaks of some things in the Old Testament as provisional and imperfect. And that's what it's getting at, right? So um, what you have is a movement from the earthly to the heavenly, from the the old to the new, you've got earthly blessings, earthly curses, but those things ultimately are the promised land, for example, the, the battles fought to attain the promised land. The promised land becomes an image and a type of heaven itself, right? So the whole movement of the Exodus in bondage to Egypt, uh, out through the, the Red Sea, and then journey through the wilderness to the promised land is really the prototype of salvation. So that you, you're mm-hmm. bondage to sin, delivered, new Exodus, but, but not simply for political liberation. Even in the Exodus, that's not the goal. The goal is actually a, a freedom to worship. Right, that, yeah. that's, that's the whole orientation of the book of Exodus. And even as you go atop Mount Sinai, uh, so they get to Sinai in Exodus 19, get 10 commandments in 20, and then 24, you have the kind of covenant uh, sacrifice and ratification ceremony. And then in 24, 11, you've got this kind of banquet feast where they beheld God in the presence of God. And for the ancient Jews, going atop Sinai is like going to heaven itself. Mm-hmm. And the tabernacle complex, like the Holy Holies, that's like taking Sinai with you. And so this becomes kind of the prototype. Um, and then the manna, for example, the manna ceases when they get to the promised land, Joshua 5, 12, the manna. So the manna is precisely the food for the journey after the exodus before the promised land, just as there's been a new exodus with the cross and the manna, the new manna, the heavenly manna, the Eucharist sustains us in our journey. And then when we get there, the sign right now is the reality. It is Jesus, but the sign will give way to face-to-face communion. And so um, when you look at that exodus movement, from Egypt, the Sinai, this banquet in the presence of God. I mean, this is where, and you have all these, like in Isaiah 25, six through eight, you have this, one of the greatest expressions of this messianic banquet hope for all people's abundance of wine, where death is overcome, I will swallow up death forever. This is all this messianic messianic banquet motif. 
which Jesus taps into and fulfills in the Eucharist, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so you get this kind of convergence from the earthly to the heavenly. Mm. Uh, so I, I guess, so like, to your question, I'm kind of going on and on. This but is great. The gradualness of revelation, having a, a, okay. an attentive ear for that. I speak to my four-year-old differently. I speak to my 13-year-old, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the way in which, where you are in the story, get a sense for the big picture, have a sense for the movement from the earthly to the heavenly, right? So the earthly battles image really the spiritual battles we have to undergo to get to the ultimate promised land. Um, and then to read it canonically. So to have, you know, Benedict Emeritus um, used to say as Ratzinger that the New Testament writers themselves, especially the gospel writers, they are the normative theologians. It, 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 not just, you know, historians, they're the normal theologians. It's not just what they recount. It's how they recount it, how they see the, the story of Israel and the story of humanity climaxing in Jesus. Um, I think there's a need and there's more to say, more to do to return to that though, because I think Catholics can fall into a trap of kind of either a uh, kind of a magisteriology mm -hmm. or a theologianology. And, and these great doctors of the church, like Aquinas, I mean, they, they see a lot of their, what they're doing is expounding the implications of scripture. Mm. Uh, so as, as, as tough as it can be on occasion, we go to mass. I love John Paul II. I love Aquinas. You'll never hear them read at mass. Mm -hmm. You'll never hear them read at mass. So there's a privileged um, mm -hmm. place for sacred scripture as, as Dave Arabum, Vatican II, called for scripture to become, once again, the soul of theology. Not in a kind of Protestant soul scripture sense, but the animating principle mm. as, as the God-breathed word because of nothing else do we say it's divinely authored. In the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to get to that. Yeah. But before we do, I want to talk about what you said about this gradual revelation. Yeah. Is it, Can that become problematic though? Because I imagine you could begin to read God's words in the Old Testament and start explaining them away or saying, well, that's him talking to someone who's not fully developed and therefore we don't have to take him at his word or yeah. Or yeah. is it more just like you said, well, everything has to be read through an, in, through the cross as the interpretive grid. Uh, through the cross, the interpretive grid, but, but no, I, you make a good point. I think a great way to dive into that would be the law question, right? So, um, some like Aquinas, uh, and this is very at home in the tradition of the fathers, uh, distinguishes among the law, the moral law, the ceremonial law and the mm. judicial or civil law. So moral law, I mean, the greatest concentration of that's gonna be like 10 commandments, uh, the ceremonial or ritual Leviticus, the judicial or civil law. Uh, Deuteronomy. Now you've got other parts sprinkled throughout, but 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 that's that's really kind of a classic codification. Um, so on the one hand, being attentive to the different kinds of law, and the other thing too, if I could, and I'll, I'll get right to your question. But when these law codes were given, so Leviticus, it's not an accident. Follows immediately after the golden calf. And there's a, a kind of a golden calf 2.0 in Numbers 25 called the Baal Pit or incident, mm -hmm. which is at the end of the 40 year wandering. It's the second generation. So the the adults of the Exodus commit the golden calf. Their children commit the Baal Peor episode. And then not coincidentally, after the Baal Peor episode on the plains of Moab, we're given Deuteronomy. And so seeing one, the topical differences of the laws, and then also when they were given is a clue to what's going to be permanent mm -hmm. and what's going to be temporary. So take an example, which I think it may be partly where you're, you're, you're going. Um, say it, the prohibition against adultery is part of the moral law. And because what happens in the new covenant is the moral law continues. The, the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ and the judicial or civil law dies in Christ because the church is not a nation state. And so that's why those laws don't apply. But take, take adultery. The moral law continues, but the punishment prescribed for adultery, that's part of the judicial law. That's part of the, the, the civil law. So in terms of the new covenant, the prohibition against adultery continues, but the, the prescription to stone the adulterer or the adulteress does not. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think having a sense for the different kinds of law and why those laws were given in context. Mm -hmm. Again, when Paul says in, in, in uh, Galatians 3.19 that the law was, quote, added because of transgression, this is part of what he has in mind, that it was fall and then God meeting his children where they are. I mean, if you've got a righteous son or daughter, they don't need as many rules. Yeah. But if they are, keep going off the grid, the curfew comes down, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of the fatherly dynamic of what's going on there. I mean, just give you one other example. Um, and, and this, I don't mean to give too many details, but um, you have sacrifice before the golden calf, mm -hmm. but you do not have daily mandatory sacrifice until after the golden calf. Really? Uh, no, you don't. And, and there's a clue. If you look at like Exodus 8:26, <clears throat> uh, for example, where Pharaoh says to Moses, go sacrifice in the land. And Moses mm. says, we can't, if we do, mm -hmm, the Egyptians mm -hmm. will stone us because what's implied by that is something about the sacrifice we're called to, to make is subversive of the worship around now, us. Now I've heard that. I remember hearing that in this great adventure that, that each of these 
these plagues were something to do with a god that the Egyptians yeah. worshipped. Is that actually true? How do you no, know no, that it, that's true? Well, I, 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 it, it's true. It's tough to line up all of them, yeah. right? But like like Hoppy was worshipped in the Nile and then Hecate and the frogs. So a number of the plagues line up very, very well. Some uh, we're not entirely sure, but I'd point you to, I mean, th- this is but, the, but Break this open for those listening who have no idea what we're talking about, because yeah. this is really fascinating. So, so the plagues, the 10 plagues, uh, don't think of this as like divine power play, these are strategic strikes against polytheism, right? They've, they've been in this Egyptian environment for a long time. So go back to Exodus 12, 3, 12. So God calls Moses and he says, I'm going to, you're going to go redeem the people. Uh, you're going to go back to Egypt, you're going to free my people. And he's like, when I go back and, and, and I say, God's going to redeem you, they're going to say, which God? So which God should I tell them? Huh. And that's just a sign of the kind yeah. of polytheistic environment they've been in for so long. And in the divine name, the tetragrammaton, the son given, the, the I am who am, this is in effect saying I am not, which is, it's built off of the Hebrew verb hayat to be, uh, he is the one who is, he's not like these local deities. The, the whole movement of the Exodus is to get them not only physically out of Egypt, but to get Egypt spiritually out of Israel's heart. That's what the golden calf is. It's a return back to Egypt. So the, the plagues really are targeting idolatry, targeting mm. polytheism. If you look at Exodus 12, 12, it's very explicit that I've brought in these plagues, brought judgments, quote, against the gods of Egypt. It's repeated again in Numbers 33, verse 4. Interesting. Um, so that's so already I there. I think the way and, I've and, heard Jeff w- Cavins describe it, like if you're going to worship frogs, here's a bunch of frogs. Or if you're going to worship the Nile, we're going to kill it and it's going to turn to blood, that kind of thing. That totally. And then the the Egypt concept of ma'at, uh, which is like the kind of cosmic order of things, it was Pharaoh's job to maintain that. Well, <laughs> his inability to do so is on full display. So Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's own kind of deity ship uh, and his own inability to do that is, is a clear sign of who the real and living God is. Uh, and then after the golden calf, that problem is just even more pronounced. And so now, and so the sacrifices, and you have different kinds that, that can be seen in different ways, point to Christ. But one reason that Aquinas mentions in the Summa, for example, why the rise of mentor sacrifice, part of it is to eradicate their addiction to idolatry. Hmm. Um, that that's that. So in other words, when you start seeing the reason for things in context, I think that's really, really helpful. And this isn't new. This is the perspective of like Maimonides, a, Jew, a medieval Jewish yep. philosopher. I mean, so this isn't like a brand new theory. Yeah. This is something that the the fathers of the church saw this uh, many ancient Jews. If you look at the Targums, if you look at the Jewish Targums of like Onkelos, and um, if you look at like the Targum on Exodus eight twenty six and things like that, they'll say explicitly they're called to sacrifice. Yeah because of the Egyptian worship around them. So, so, so even like the prohibition against pork, things like that, all of this is designed to institutionalize a separation of Israel because they, they need to be quarantined and rehabbed. And one day it'll be time for them to be like to the nations when they're strong enough. Okay. Uh, and the Pharisees in effect are riding in that wave of separation as holiness. Jesus is bringing about this promise to Abraham. Because they're in Egypt for 400 years. Several centuries, yeah. Is that, am I wrong? How long yeah, is it? Well, the, it, it, there's a few wrinkles that would, that would affect the time. So in Exodus 1240, there's a discrepancy between the Hebrew and the Septuagint. Okay. And the Septuagint makes it sound like they were there for that long, um, not just in Egypt, but including from Abraham forward, okay. which would then shorten it uh, to 200 something. Does that okay. make sense? So, so yeah. but it's centuries for sure, but there's a textual discrepancy yeah. uh, that would, you know, would affect it. Now there's different sacrifices that are asked for in Leviticus. Um, but I guess the, the yeah. one we're talking about here, when you talk about daily sacrifice, this is of animals in particular, right? Right. No, it be, might because be worth this kind is of what running Egypt through. Is, I mean, yeah, so you've got you've got so so on the one hand, um, the rise in the uptake of sacrifice is in part because of what the golden calf and the the which again the golden calf itself, um, the gold think of wealth, but the, the calf or the bovine symbol throughout the ancient years was a symbol of sexual virility, manliness. Okay. So think of think of money, sex, and power. That's what's going on. Whoa. So the more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, the it definitely is an uptick because of that. Um, but you've got the, the, the whole, the whole law, the burnt offering, uh, you got the mecha, the grain offering. So you have, you also have non bloody sacrifices. Yeah, the so grain, what are they meant the to gra- remedy? Well, uh, so the, the, and then you got the shilamim, the peace offering, and then the chata, the sin offering, and then the asham, the guilt offering. So if you think of the whole law, the whole thing is burnt up. So it's, so maybe I guess back up, I'd say sacrifice, um, in its basic form, biblically, is a ritualized self-offering. This is our this is the human vocation. What does Jean Paul II say? To make a gift of oneself. What does Jesus do? Definitively, he makes the total gift of himself. So it's a ritualized self-offering. Um, the whole the whole law, the burnt offering, all of it goes up. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of embodies that. The mincha, the grain offering, right? The, 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 so it's important to note. Yes, we have a lot of animals. It's not all, there. Are, so there's also 
unbloody sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And then you have the shalamim, the peace offering, which is a communion offering. So what can, is a peace offering? What is that? Well, it, from shalom. So shalamim. Mm -hmm. it, it, so in other words, sacrifices, you can look at some of them ex either expressing communion mm -hmm. or restoring communion with okay. God. Okay. So those first three really are more expressing communion. And those are the ones that you see before the golden calf. Okay. After the golden calf, you got the chatat, the sin offering, and the asham, the guilt offering, because it's clear that this thing, it, it, in other words, you might think of this. In, so in part, the sacrifice is embodying the punishment that Israel deserves after the golden calf. After her, she swore the oath of fidelity and then she's, you know, um, goes against it in an yeah. apostasy. Um, so, and then the peace offering though, the, the most important subset of that was the todah, which is the, th the thank offering. Okay. Now, if you translate that into Greek, you get Eucharistia. Okay. The ancient rabbis had a saying that in the messianic era, all sacrifices will cease except for the Todah. So what they that? got that right in well, the Eucharist. All right. Well, what does yeah. that look like in the Old Testament? What does well, that thank yeah. offering actually look like? How so, do you offer that? Well, see, this is, uh, yeah. I do mean, um, what's ex so you, in Leviticus 7, you get the Todah, but mm -hmm. it really gets a much greater play in the Davidic period with the Psalms, the, 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 the oh. sacrifice of Thanksgiving. So gotcha. um, the idea behind a Todah is that often uh, you have somebody who's suffering, they cry out, they're delivered, and then they give thanks. And what's really intriguing is if you look at the Passover and the Passover specifically after it's after the first one, when it's, mm -hmm. when it's celebrated, it has all the earmarks of a todah. They were suffering, they cried out, they were delivered, and now we remember and we enter into that. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably the link. And, and when you look at the Passover, then not just in Exodus twelve, but in the first century with Jesus, um, part of it is these Hallel Psalms, Psalms one thirteen to one eighteen, a number of which are todah Psalms. If you look at like one sixteen one eighteen, in other words, it seems to be the case that by the first century, the Passover was understood as kind of a corporate todah, mm -hmm. and so. This, here's this Eucharistic thank offering fulfillment. Um, so th this is how I would look at it in terms of from the old to the new. So you got the Exodus yeah. 12, you've got the 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 mention of the Todah in Leviticus 7, but it becomes massively important in the Davidic era. And, and I so there's a number of, I guess, moving parts, but when I, when I teach about the covenants, uh, especially Abraham, Moses, and David, um, with the Mosaic covenant, you always got to ask, where am I? Is this pre or post golden calf? There's there's a sense in which, so St. Paul in Galatians 3, 8, for example, he says that the, 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 the quote, gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Paul sees the new covenant, not simply coming after the old covenant, but actually is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic. So in other words, it's not simply chronological. The Abrahamic and the Davidic have a greater symmetry with the new than many parts of the Mosaic. So the pre-golden calf Mosaic gets subsumed into the new Ten Commandments. The post-golden calf Mosaic dies in Christ. Uh, so in other words, because the Davidic covenant, Davidic kingdom, that whole era is kind of the high point of the Old Testament. And we could go through this, but it becomes international. The temples embodying this, the glory. Um, it, there's, there's a number of parts where here's the kind of closest approximation to the gospel going beyond the bounds of Israel, but then it shatters after Solomon's son, Rehoboam, kingdom divides, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, that Davidic kingdom gives you an earthly and imperfect blueprint of the kingdom that Jesus brings about. And so the fact that the Todah becomes kind of the preeminent sacrifice in the Davidic period is is, is hugely important for this Eucharistic Eucharistic kingdom fulfillment. Mm. Why don't we do that first? Tell us, keeping in mind that those who are watching, may, may, this might be the first time they're kind of hearing about this, talk about how the Eucharist is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb because... Yeah, I, so... Um, what I love about, and again, when I teach, I love to show how the Eucharist or how Jesus fulfills the story of Israel, but simultaneously the story of humanity at the same time. So uh, in the Passover, um, so you have the plagues, and then mm -hmm. the 10th plague, there uh, the Israelites are told to slay a Passover lamb, to eat the lamb, uh, and to smear the blood on the doorpost, and then the, the death will pass over those houses. And, and this becomes kind of a, again, a, a, a prototype because Jesus brings about a new exodus, not from Egypt, not from Babylon, not from Rome, but from sin, death, and the devil. But key to Exodus 12 is you had to eat the lamb. You had to consume the lamb. The mm -hmm. sacrifice was not completed until you ate it. And by the way, the Todah is the only sacrifice where the worshiper eats Typically, the priest eats some, or it's all burned up. But in the Todah, the worshiper has to eat mm. part of the sacrifice. And again, this this fits the Passover narrative. Um, so Jesus at the Last Supper, this is a Passover meal. Um, you've got, um, and it's in the Last Supper, you've got 
Passover, you got other elements in the background, but say Passover, it's a Passover meal. And Jesus is, we say Lamb of God, Lamb of God, Lamb of God at Mass. Mm. This isn't because Jesus is cute and cuddly and meek. It's because he's the new Passover, we're at the new Exodus. And you look at Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, Christ our our Paschal Lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let's keep the feast. In other words, the sacrifice is not complete until he's consumed. And so the Last Supper, the cross, and the Eucharist, there's a tight threefold connection there because when we consume the Eucharist, we complete the Passover uh, so that death may pass over us. And one of the things I always say before I receive, I always quote Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, So he wrote these letters in 107 AD and then is martyred in Rome. Um, But in his letter to the Ephesians, so the same Ephesians that Paul wrote to, chapter 20, uh, he refers to the Eucharist as, and this is a guy that was ordained by Peter, (laughs) ordained by Peter, knew the apostles, speaks of the Eucharist as the quote, medicine of immortality, Mm -hmm. antidote against death. Uh, I always say that to myself and I always say- How do you say it? Well, I just say medicine of immortality as I'm walking up there uh, because what's our greatest fear? It's death, it's yeah. corruption, it, it's the finality of it all. And what does Jesus promise? You look at John 6, the Bread of Life discourse, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 unless you eat the flesh, the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. And he speaks of raising you up on the last day. This is where Ignatius is getting it from. Uh, so the Eucharist fulfills the Passover, but it also fulfills our, you know, the greatest Adamic curse that we're worried about. You are dust and to dust you shall return. The, the overcoming of the grave. And I know I'm bouncing around a lot, but the whole like, I'm spiritual, not religious. I'm like, that... And, and again, I love my Protestant brothers and sisters. That might make sense there, but you can't replace the Eucharist. That's why we go. We don't go just for a great homily, though we're excited when it happens. We don't go just for the music. We're excited when it happens. It's because there you have the bread of life mm-hmm. that overcomes the grave. And in receiving Jesus' risen body, we have hope in our own resurrection. And so would the, would the, in your experience, would the Protestant look at that, that typology you've just laid out and say, I agree with what you're saying, but for us, Eucharist is taken in a spiritual sense. Is that how they try to get around it? And- the, well, I mean, <laughs> you've got different types of Protestants, obviously, yeah. um, but there's a lot of exciting movements. For example, a lot of Protestants, in terms of the scholars, the, the, the academics, yeah, Jesus is bringing about the new Exodus. Well, if you look at the first Exodus, it went from liberation to worship. Well, how did Jesus think he'd be worshiped in the new Exodus? Mm. What about all these messianic banquet motifs? What about uh, all these, um, you know, another theme in the old Testament is this, this bread of the presence, the lechem hapanim, which okay. so it's in the holy place. So you get the three parts of the tabernacle. Um, you have this bread and wine. It's, it's if you look at Exodus 25, it's right around verse 30 or so. It speaks of the bread and the wine of the presence. Uh, and then Leviticus 24 verses five through nine. Um, but this, this, um, this bread of the presence, the priest ate it every Sabbath. It was like a communion meal. Mm. It was basically a making present <clears throat> entry into that original Sinai banquet in the presence of God. Well, is there a, a meal, a bread and wine of the presence the the real presence of Jesus where we can eat in the presence of God. So all these, I I think, so I think a couple things, I guess this is the larger question, but I think we've, we are too reductionistic in how we read the old Testament and what we think the ancient Jews were hoping for. We, I mean, so often you hear, well, they were just hoping for a military Messiah and they're just so earthly, earthly, earthly. And it's like, have you read the literature? Uh, Have you read Daniel? Have you read Isaiah Isaiah 65 verse 17, 18, this hoping for a new creation, a new heavens, a new earth, a messianic banquet. In other words, I think once, we really reclaim and, and see how elevated the ancient Jewish hope was, we see how tightly Jesus actually steps into it, fulfilling, as I said, both the story of Israel and the story of humanity. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. Have you engaged Jewish people about this and about what they think the uh, uh, Old Testament Jews were Yeah, I, so I've got um, uh, another friend of mine, Michael Barber. He, yeah. he's, and I, so I see these guys every year at SBL, Society of Biblical Literature. He used to which teach is, me theology in my undergrad. That's great. He <laughs> well, used to teach me theology in my undergrad. Right? Yeah. He, he's, he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, him and I think him and Petrie, for example, and John yeah. Burks, but I think they're some of the finest Catholic book scholars uh, around. Right now, I'm doing a seminar on developments in Catholic biblical scholarship because what's, what's happened now, and you've always had Catholic biblical scholars, you have Mary Healy, for example, um, but you, what's what's different now? It seems is not do you only not only do you have uh, biblical scholars who are Catholic, you've got devoutly Catholic scholars with all the linguistic and historical street cred you could ever want, and they're building wow. huge bridges. Was that not true fifty years ago? Hundred um, years ago. 
I don't think so. I really, I don't, I don't, I don't know that. So they're gaining the respect of their Protestant colleagues without selling their soul. Yeah. I think that's, what's different to be, to be, I mean, if I could be that Frank, I, yeah. I think that's, and I think it's, when you say selling this, so what do you mean by that? Do you mean well, without I mean, of take a look like compromising on the, yeah, I mean, well, okay. Like say, uh, father Raymond Brown or Joseph Fitzmaier, great. I mean, reputable scholars. Mm-hmm. They got the attention of the scholarly world and some of their work is great. Uh, some of it, um, I think is suspect as, and, and it's suspect in terms of, um, the integration of faith and reason. And, okay. um, you know, does Catholic faith, hold my exegesis back or does it actually help me see things in a deeper way they're there a book that barbara petrie and kincaid just came out with last august uh, paul a new covenant jew which is what a title paul a new covenant jew um hmm. and it's and the guy that wrote the forward is one of the premier protestant pauline scholars hmm. um so I haven't talked to a lot of Jews myself personally. I mean, I, I've read their works, things like that. Uh, but but Michael Barber is an example of. Uh, I just talked to him the other day. He had a lunch with a rabbi, and, and just building, building big time bridges. Um, and so, yeah, some. I mean, Protestants of different stripes will see different things. Um, but the situating Jesus and hmm. for them to see, you know, for a lot of people, the idea of Jesus found at church is like unthinkable. But what's, what's happened though as well, if you see this in terms of the, the, so one of the deep hopes of ancient Jews is the, is the restoration of all 12 tribes. Okay. So you have the, you have the United, United, it's called the United Kingdom with David and Solomon around 1000 BC. And this is where you have David and Solomon ruling over all 12 tribes, but and, here's the key, and the surrounding nations. So if you look at like 1 Kings 8, 41 to 43, this is when Solomon builds the temple, uh, 1 Kings 6 to 8, and then he dedicates it with seven petitions, right? So by the way, it takes seven years to build. It's dedicated on the seventh month during the seven day feast of tabernacles with seven petitions. It, it, it's it, So Eden, tabernacle, temple, these are all coming together, right? Uh, anybody who, who's in Christ is a new creation um the kingdom divides after solomon and then the 10 northern tribes go their own way and then then you have the tribe of judah left Mm -hmm. Uh, this is why jew and israelite are not the same thing Mm -hmm. so every jew etymologically it means from the tribe of judah every jew is an israelite but not every israelite is a jew Mm -hmm. so now eventually fast forward to 722 bc the assyrians uh so the neo-assyrian empire from 745 to the 620s uh ultimately the capital is destroyed in seven and 612 with nineveh they're the premier power i mean the the most feared empire around they destroy the northern kingdom in 722 they scatter the 10 northern tribes they mingle them with gentiles i mean you've heard of the lost tribes of israel Mm -hmm. this is where it comes from though some of those tribes go south uh some of those people but for all intents and purposes you don't hear about the 10 northern tribes Again, they really become intermingled with the Gentiles. And so one of the great, ho- and, and so then you have the Southern tribe, Judah, kingdom of Judah, and then Babylon destroys them in 586. And then they go to Babylon exile. They return, but it's only a partial return. It's only the Jews from Judah who have returned. The deep, deep hope for the ancient Israelites is that one day God would restore, the Messiah would restore all 12 tribes. But to do that, you're going to have to restore the nations because 10 twelfths of them are mingled with the Mm -hmm. nations. When Paul is going out to the Gentiles, he sees himself as in part bringing about the restoration of quote, all Israel. So, um, Long story short, what a lot of ecumenical scholars have seen is that when you understand the church as the fulfillment of the family of Abraham, the fulfillment of this restoration of all Israel, Mm. all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense to them in the first century. And when you have kind of cultic entering into this in terms of the Eucharist, Last Supper, things like the sacramentality, like scholars that know the first century and know the Old Testament, they're like, that's actually quite at home. It's, this is not a medieval invention at all. So this is back to the first step. Situating Jesus in his first century Jewish context has actually made sense of a ton of Catholic things. Ah, and you know, with, with Barbara and Petrie and these guys at the SBL conference, it's like 10,000 10, Bible scholars from all over the English speaking world. So like I've met N.T. Wright there, uh, Australia, England, New Zealand. I mean, every, every, and it's all kinds, every kind of, you know, I mean, atheist, agnostic, mm-hmm. uh, to- totally secular. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Jewish New Testament scholars, all kinds. Um, what I tell my students in terms of like apologetics is we can remove obstacles and we can provide motives of credibility, right? I mean, there's a, there's a point where you can't bring someone all the way there, but, but I've seen tons of obstacles removed Mm. for these scholars to make, to make it credible again, make it believable, make it reasonable. And their eyes have been open. It it sounds to me like what you're saying is maybe 50, hundred years ago, we had scholars who were getting attention in uh, scholarly circles, but maybe uh, weren't fully Catholic or compromised with some of their Catholicism. But then on the other hand, you know, as the new apologetics kind of revolution took place in America, you've got people who are maybe very good at 
responding to sort of Protestant arguments. But it sounds like what you're saying in this new kind of crop of scholars is that you've got both the uh, kind of intellectual uh, chops and then also the fully Catholic and that that's helping our evangelical friends. I, big time. I, and even the secular ones. I, I mean, it's kicking the door open. I mean, if you look at the history of biblical scholarship, um, a lot of what became biblical scholarship was a post-Reformation phenomenon. Because then you, you were, I mean, here's the part of the challenge is you're moving the Bible, removing the Bible from the context of the yes, church, from the yes. context of the liturgy, right? There's a, there's a quote in uh, Bondage of the Will from Luther where he says, any passage in scripture that is not clear will be made clear by future grammatical and syntactical research. And that's like a charter to the Enlightenment view of the Bible and taking the Bible. They put it in the academy, not the church, right? Yes. Uh, so I, I'd say Catholics on the whole were kind of like stood arm's length from that whole process. For, so that's where we were behind the game. The, the, it was all a Protestant thing. Interesting. And it became more and more secularized in the Enlightenment context, uh, more and more kind of secularized. And then... Um, Is, was the idea that the Catholic scholar need not be interested in that because the church had the church it, to tell him it was yeah and it was it was kind of a poisonous rabbit trail okay. that was just going to lead to nowhere uh you had leo the 13th at the end you know, of the 19th century uh big proponent of biblical scholarships it, it was brewing but really it's and then Pius the 12th uh divino Fonte spiritu in, in uh, the mid 40s um it was growing, but then after Vatican II, not not because of Vatican II, but it, but it, it was perceived that uh, the floodgates opened and you can do what the Protestants are doing and you can study scripture merely in human terms. And, and so you had that just frankly craziness. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not because of Vatican II, but, but, but after Vatican II. Um, and it took a while for the church to sort that out. And so the evangelicals, for example, were doing much better work, I would say, in like 1980 uh, than we were, because we were a few generations behind. And it was the, the what the evangelicals did, this is why I went to study at Trinity. They were very good at the literary, the linguistic, the historical. They were they were actually willing to engage the critics and be critical of the critics. Whereas the Catholics, I'd say at that point, were simply drinking this the critical Kool Aid. Ah. Um, if, if that makes sense. Yep. And so uh, we've caught up, I think. That's really we've fascinating. Caught up and we've, but we've caught up not only, so as I mentioned that Paul Newcomen Jew, one of the things that Michael Gorman, the Protestant scholar who wrote the foreword said in there, you know, uh, these scholars, see, so for example, the Last Supper account in 1 Corinthians 11 yeah. often doesn't get a lot of uh, treatment because most of Pauline scholarship is influenced by Protestantism. But Catholics who are more attentive to the liturgical echoes, the importance of the liturgy, the importance of the liturgy is the way by which we enter into Christ. He pointed out, he's like, look, their Catholic tradition here has actually made them more attentive to things that seem to be in Paul. So to see the Catholic faith is not a detriment to scholarship, but actually something that that helps incredibly, even at an exegetical level. I, I'll give you one more, I guess, just brief anecdote. Um, Petrie in his Jesus and Last Supper gave, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant, um, one of the I don't know, raise another problem. One of the difficulties uh, or traditional challenges uh, is the dating of the Last Supper mm -hmm. because the synoptics, at least on its face, seem to give a slightly different view than John okay. uh, in terms of, of was the Last Supper a Passover meal or or not. Mm -hmm. um, Petrie gives a fat, I mean, this whole chapter could have been a whole book. It's, it's, really? it's like a hundred pages. I mean, okay. Like one of the most brilliant treatments of the issue that I've ever seen. And then just two, um, two Februarys ago, he gave a paper at Ave Maria's Aquinas conference and showed how Aquinas actually anticipated his view. Oh, that's fantastic. And Petrie's, and, and the paper, and I shared it with my students. I mean, the paper's like, look at Aquinas, not only the great philosopher, the great theologian, but look at his exegetical and historical carefulness that, that literally basically proposed the same view that Petrie took hundreds and hundreds Which of pages. Which is? Well, okay. Um, so basically it comes down to this, that the word Passover for the ancient Jews uh, could be used in more than one way. So I guess just in a nutshell, you could be you could use the word Passover yeah. uh, to refer to the, the Passover lamb. Uh -huh. You could re use the word Passover. So when we, English translations, like even if you look at Luke's gospel, like Luke 22, verse seven and eight, it speaks of the Pascha. And uh, translations will often add lamb, but it doesn't have lamb there. In other words, you would just say Passover, and that could be the lamb. I see. That could be the meal. That could be the uh, week-long feast. Holiday, yeah. Okay? Or the Passover peace offerings that are offered throughout the week. Okay. So what happens is you've got these series of, of references to Passover in John's gospel, and s scholars who don't know that Jewish backdrop take it to only mean basically the, 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 the first original sa Passover sacrifice. So what, what happens, for example, is when you have in John when uh, the Jews don't want to enter the praetorium because they want to be able to eat the Passover, they don't want to defile themselves, scholars say, see, look, uh, John has Jesus 
uh, die when the Passover lambs are sacrificed. The meal is that night, Good Friday night, and therefore what the synoptics recount on Holy Thursday can't have been a Passover meal, even mm-hmm. though they tell you a dozen times that it is a Passover meal. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so basically, that it, so it very much comes down to squaring the synoptic evidence with the Johanna evidence in John, and the key to the John evidence is to, to be sensitive that the, the word Passover is, does not mean the exact same thing every time. Gotcha. And Petrie Marshall's tons of uh, first century Jewish evidence to, and, and biblical evidence to support that. Uh, and then it's amazing that Aquinas... So Petrie came up with this and then retrospectively yeah, found out that Aquinas I, proved it? Petrie said to me that that book represents 10 years of his life. And you could feel it. When my students read this, I mean, it's over 500 pages. And Which, he, which book is it? Jesus and the Last Supper. So it's it's okay. the academic version of, of Jewish the Jewish roots. roots. Gotcha. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, but then Aquinas here, without the Dead Sea Scrolls, without tons of Jewish literature that we have at our disposal, already anticipated that conclusion. It, it, principally in his Gospel of John comment. It's in the Summa a little bit, but the Gospel of John commentary. So yes. you dug up all these quotes. What I love about Petrian, so maybe here's another thing that's new, is um, to do the exegetical, roll up your sleeves, learn the Hebrew, learn the Aramaic, do that hard work, but also do it in conjunction with Justin Martyr, yeah. Irenaeus, Aquinas, and, and show the, the, the symmetry. Because mm-hmm. th- here's the thing, here's my word. I love Newman. I love Newman. I think Catholics sometimes will scream development of doctrine as like an intellectual panacea that fixes everything. Interesting. Well, like, well, doctrine developed. Well, it's like, okay, yeah, but the person in the pew, like, you can't give the impression that, well, um, you know, they want to know. Did Jesus and the apostles think the same thing as the Council of Nicaea? Yeah. Did Jesus and the apostles think the same thing as Trent? Obviously, our understanding of the faith does grow and develop, but it's not adding to what Jesus gave us. Um, as I said, the Jewish Jesus, this is the Catholic mm. Jesus. So basically, if you don't know the Old Testament, you have a supremely deficient view of Christ and the church. Uh, it's not that everybody's got to go It's not that people. everyone's got to know, no, of course. No, but 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 you... you It'd be like you, walking into the last few scenes of the third Star Wars movie without seeing Without the question, ones. and I would just press this too. You couldn't imagine Paul giving the kerygma without reference to the story of Israel. I mean, if, if that's the read of Paul, then you're not really reading Paul, yeah. right? So, so it's not that everybody's got to go run out and be a, you know, a Hebrew scholar, yeah. but, but, but the, and, and if you've never read the old Testament and I, I wouldn't start someone for the very first time, I, I would say read the gospels and you'll get something uh-huh. out of it, but you'll get so much more if you, if you okay. know the story and the hopes and the dreams and how Jesus has said taps into and transcends. Mm-hmm the hopes of the first century. So I want to get to that, the kind of timeline. Before we do, we've touched upon Sola Scriptura. Tell us why Sola Scriptura is, well, what it means and why it's false. Yeah, so so Latin for scripture alone, and it was one of the kind of Protestant uh, battle cries at the Reformation. uh, And and I, when I was at Trinity Evangelical, it's the only Catholic in the program, and when this would come up, I'd say, well, Sola Scriptura, so it it typically is an anti-tradition thing. It's Bible alone. That's all I need. And then I would say, well, Sola Scriptura, isn't that one of your traditions? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they look at me like I had three heads, but, but I'm like, unless it's taught emphatically, in which case would it still be? I suppose. Well, but see, see, here's the thing is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the Bible do- doesn't teach it. Um, the, the proof text for it in second Timothy, yeah, you've got uh, a- Paul is talking about the scriptures when you, Timothy were a child, which has to be the old Testament. That's yeah. what and I actually had a Protestant scholar, Dr. Willem Van Gemmer, my old Testament scholars. He actually took that position in class. He used to love to like, you know, a oh, position me really? to poke his. Yeah, I mean, the Protestant academics tend to argue differently than the rank and file. It, it, uh-huh, so, okay. Um, but what, what I think it. it um, so just for those know, at home, we're talking about that bit where where Saint Paul says, "Yeah, all the man of God, inspired yeah, say it for us, yeah. and profitable for teaching, instruction, etc." Um, of course, all Scripture is inspired, but nowhere does it say Scripture is your only rule of faith, your only authority. And then right. pair that with like Second Thessalonians two fifteen or Second Thessalonians. Yep. 3, yeah, six or first Corinthians eleven two, where he, he, Paul exhorts us to hold fast to the traditions you were taught, either orally or by letter. And, and the thing is, think about the apostles. They, when we speak of tradition, I think sometimes. Um, we think of it too cerebrally and intellectually. Like Jesus mm-hmm. gave these private classes that didn't make it into the Bible. Mm-hmm. The catechism is very, very good on this. Like a catechism about 80, the doctrine, life, and worship. In other words, 
Think about an ancient rabbi disciple relationship. Jesus lived with the apostles for three years. I mean, I joke with my students, I'm like, look, when you've had a professor for three or four times, you can finish his or her sentences. And they always laugh because the ones who've had me, like, yep, that's true. I'm like, imagine not just coming to a class and not yeah. just having me for a semester. Imagine if we traveled the country together and I gave the same intro lecture over and over and over again. What do the, what is tradition? It's the life of Christ passed on to the disciples, the apostles. So they watch how he prays, how he worships, how he serves, how he teaches. All of that is what we mean by sacred tradition. And the apostles, they found churches that are up and running, celebrating the sacraments long before they ever receive a text of New Testament scripture. Right. I'd recommend a, fact, a fantastic book on this, uh, Consuming the Word by Scott Hahn. Yeah. He, he kind of have a, uh, like a liturgical trilogy, Lamb Supper from Written Text of the Living Word and then Consuming uh, uh, consuming the Word. And in that book, the third one, Consuming the Word, um, he lays out a pretty extended argument for the, for basically the first 100, 200 years or so when early Christians spoke of the New Testament. See, mm -hmm. Testament is the Latinization mm -hmm. of the word covenant. They meant the new covenant and they meant the new covenant sacrifice, which is the Eucharist that, as he jokes, not joking, he says the New Testament was first a sacrifice before it was a document. Mm -hmm. the, the New Testament texts were basically those were the texts fit to be read in the context of the new covenant sacrifice, the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole, the tradition is logically and chronologically prior yeah. to scripture. And so, so what I would say is once you have that sense for scripture as swimming within the tradition, scripture has a privileged place, but within maybe, the tradition. Maybe talk also about the fact that sola scriptura presupposes scriptura, which isn't in scripture. Well, the issue of the canon yeah. is what you're, what yeah, you're that's getting. what I'm getting at. Right. I mean, there's no inspired tip of contents. I mean, the Bible is really a collection of many books. It's not one book. And so the, the even the very issue of what makes up the Bible itself, the list of books that yep. are, are declared inspired and canonical, that's something bequeathed to us by tradition, yeah. by tradition. Mm -hmm. So the, the issue of canon is tied up with the issue of authority. Uh, you, there's really a need, you, as Peter Craft, one of our heroes, uh, once joked, you can't get infallible orange juice from a fallible Catholic orange. Either you trust the discernment of the Holy Spirit with the bishops who helped. The, 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 the mm -hmm. bishops don't give canonicity to the scripture. They don't give inspiration to it, but there is a need for an authority to recognize what is in fact scripture. Mm -hmm. And there were questions. I mean, there were other letters that were uh, letter first class. That, yep. Well, yeah, yeah that uh, were highly revered, and so and yeah. you read them, they're beautiful. So, right, so it's not, it's not abundantly clear that you can simply decipher this on a human level. Uh, so the scripture writings of the New Testament, yeah, we deem they're, they're apostolic. That's why, right, they're apostolic, uh, either written by an apostle or an associate of the apostles. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a need for an authority to adjudicate uh, those questions. Help us understand why, people usually say why Catholic Bibles are bigger, but yeah. I'm gonna ask you, yeah, Gary why, book, right? why are Protestant Bibles smaller? Yeah, so I, I, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. So one, once again, the issue of canon is tied up with authority. It's really something given to us by tradition. Um, and we the, see this at the, at the where is it, Pope Damasus I, the Council of Rome 382. 382, Carthage, Hippo. But even in 382, even though he has the division, which is a little bit different to how we would divide it, the, the exact same books he lays out are what we have in a Catholic Bible today. No, that's exactly right. And so we speak of the Deuterocanonicals as Catholics, the, the seven books, like 1, 2, Maccabees, Sirach, Wisdom, Baruch, Tobit, Judith, um, that are in Catholic Bibles that are not in Protestant Bibles. Um, so here I'd say a couple, couple things. One often traditionally Protestants assumed a closed Old Testament canon. Um, mm -hmm. That a, a number of Protestants called them, that just simply is not the case at all. They, the canon in Jesus' day, and even after, even the centuries after, there are still debates among Jews like Song of Songs, Esther, um, Ecclesiastes. The canon was not closed by any means at all. And, and you can see this. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a great witness to this. So you 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 clearly have different senses of canon at play. Um, you you have the Septuagint, and we have the the Hebrew text, um, and it, that's even kind of a, a bit convoluted um, because the. Yeah, it used to be common to say, well, there's this Jewish, you know, Palestinian canon, and then there's this Hellenistic canon, and, and but that that really this is, is Luther's argument, right? Well, that's part of it that, that only the text written first in Hebrew <coughs> should count. Well, mm -hmm. here's a couple problems with that. One, Sirach was founded Hebrew in 1897. 
So mm-hmm. right? even though we, we have the, the whole Greek text, Kasterik tells us up front in the prog that he's translating his grandfather's work that was in Hebrew. Uh, Tobit was found at the Dead Sea Scrolls in Aramaic. Um, the Dead Sea Scroll community clearly had a bigger canon. They seem to have accepted Jubilees and First Enoch. So mm. the Jewish canon number one was not closed. Um, it wasn't closed to well after Christ. Um, the closing of the canon is an authority question. Mm-hmm. So Jesus commissioned the apostles and the bishops with that authority to make those judgments for Martin Luther. Uh, so the, those books were in the canon. They were in mm-hmm. the canon. Um, frankly, um, it's theological reasons that led Martin Luther to remove them. So second Maccabees 12 45 speaks about implies purgatory because it speaks about the, the, the help mm-hmm. of baptism and praying for the dead basically. Well, that runs afoul of his sola fide doctrine, salvation by faith alone, because if it's by faith alone, why would you need purgatory things like that? Uh, and so that, led him to get rid of, of, and that was a convenient excuse. Um, he like, wanted to get rid of James as well. That's right. Uh, yeah. Throw Jimmy in the fire. And I'd say, I guess one more thing. We tend to think of those books as like a collection. Yeah. If you look at the ancient fathers and how they debated the canon, like Baruch, for example, was never questioned. They were they were can- handled case by case. It wasn't like, <coughs> what do we do with the Deuterocanonicals? It's no, what do you do with each individual oh, book? Baruch was never questioned. But isn't it true that Jerome questioned the Deuterocanonicals? He, he did, but they, they weren't treated as a group. The way we, we think of it that way because of a post-Reformation context. Okay. They weren't treated as a group. It was, it was what do you think of these books and Jerome did have the concern about what was you know he lived in Bethlehem for 30 years and learned Hebrew from the Jews um he did have the concern of what's not written in Hebrew maybe we shouldn't accept and that was kind of uh-huh. Luther's way to kind of resurrect that um but individual fathers can I mean Aquinas right. honestly denied the immaculate conception right yeah. it's, it's not as if they're not a doctor or a father of the church because they said everything perfectly right. but on the whole they made a contribution or, or, or a reliable witness to to the great Catholic tradition mm. uh, so what do you say to, yeah. I mean Protestants who revere the Bible and yeah. there's so many Protestants who I just love and they teach me how to love yeah. scripture more I mean I, you almost want to say to them like there's more there's more right. goodness that right. you should have do you, know, do you know evangelicals who are beginning to kind of... Oh, it totally. And my, like my friend James uh, from Trinity, uh, and he'd echo this a thousand times over. I think what you, when you talk to them, you got to, one, you got to root everything in Christ. You got to show them, because um, they very often think in terms of a zero-sum game. Like if I take this piece of a pie and I give it to Mary or the saints, I take it away from Jesus. Yeah. For a Catholic, it's always it's always a participation paradigm. Mm. It, it, it's like the moon, right? Does the moon have its own light? And Bishop Barron used to love this analogy. I love it too. They, yeah, the moon doesn't have its own light. It's it's derivative. It reflects, it radiates the light of the sun. Mm-hmm. All of the Catholic faith is Christocentric. So we're not taking a piece away from it. It's Jesus through the sacraments. It's Jesus through this. It's all Jesus. So I think they have to get clear on that. And I think what happens, and James would say this, I don't feel less evangelical now that I'm Catholic, he would say. I feel more so because I, it's not that I've denied what I held a revered before. I've just embraced a fuller version of it. Could you give us a basic crash course in the, um, the timeline? In the chronology, yeah. cr- chronology of the Bible, because, and and again, I'm sure you've taught this a yeah. million times. So maybe you're bored of it by now, but you know, as Jeff Caven says, you pick up this, this, the Bible, you tell yourself you're going to read it for one whole year, and you get derailed. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that is because you're not reading the Bible chronologically. So for those who've never even heard of this concept before, they don't know who Jeff Cavins is, right. help us understand that. Yeah, so the idea behind the Bible timeline is that it, it, it breaks up the whole biblical story in light of 12 periods. You've got 14 books that, that move the narrative forward, and then you have other books that um, make more sense in that context. So you would go Genesis, Exodus, and then instead of turning to Leviticus, you would go to Numbers. And then instead of going to Deuteronomy after that, you would go to Joshua and then Judges because that, so you, you get a sense for the whole narrative. And then when you go back, um, you, you would read like Leviticus in context. Or to give you another example, uh, you'd read through one and two kings, have a sense for the Davidic kingdom. And then when you go back, you'd read the prophets. And then you realize mm-hmm. like Jeremiah, for example, is, is in the context of that Babylonian destruction. So the you can't understand the prophets in their day without understanding the rise and fall of the Davidic kingdom and its hope for its restoration. Uh, so that, that's the genius behind okay. it is that it makes it simple and you get the narrative, you get the big picture. Um, the way I've heard someone describe it is it's like they had all of these stories from scripture that they knew. Yes. But they didn't know how to put them together. And when they encountered the Bible timeline, it's like somebody put a frame around it and they could 
see it for the first time. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and you, you get to the gospels or like, so you would have, you go through, he goes to the gospel of Luke mm-hmm. and then, and then acts. And then later you'd read St. Paul's letters. Now that you know the history, I think getting a sense for the narrative, it just so Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, first and second Samuel, first, second Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, first Maccabees, Luke and acts. Yes. So if you were to read that, you would get the whole chronology you'd have of the scripture. whole biblical storyline before you. Yeah. And, and so in the, in the Bible that we produced, we've this got a- essays that introduce each of those periods where we, we summarize basically what happens and also kind of the key themes to look for. So it's kind of a synthesis of the synthesis. And then, okay. And then you've got them color coordinated. Yeah to help people memorize them. This is just brilliant. No, I mean, that's all cavens. That's all cavens. And then the, the tabs follow, yeah. follow those colors. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so you pull up Isaiah and the tab will tell you where you are in the story. So you're never lost. That's so great. Um, it, it is true though, isn't it? That I mean, I mean, Catholics typically aren't as into the scriptures as many of our evangelical brothers and sisters. That's not always the case. Obviously yeah. you can find, you know, exceptions. Uh, I mean, why is that? And to talk about this kind of resurgence that you're seeing among young Catholics, and then I want to help, and then I want to ask you to help me love the Bible, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. You know, I joke with my students when I'm like, "Okay, turn your Bibles to this," da da da, and I'm like, oh, "If you don't have your Bible, just ask your Protestant friend next to you." Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then they always chuckle and I chide them a little bit. I, you know, I think um, there's a sense in which, like Eves Kangar, a great theologian at the Second Vatican Council, spoke of the liturgy as the privileged custodian of sacred tradition. Yeah. So the liturgy community communicates the faith mm-hmm. to us. I mean, the, the, the typology of Mary, the way the readings are set up, the, the prayers, like look at the Gloria, it's communicating the faith. So on the one hand, there's a sense of which Catholics kind of got it easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, yeah. It's accessible in that way. Uh, they the encounter cl- it without knowing they're without encountering knowing it. it. The clarity of the catechism, for example. So um, I would say like real Bible study at its best subordinates itself to mm. that liturgical reading of scripture. Right. Like so that. it's, yeah. so, so it's not as if a competition, it's not as if it, but it, it, it's going to deepen it. So I think it's, it makes sense. People are busy people. It's hard. Yeah. Right? I mean, like life catches up with you, right? You're, you're a dad. I'm a dad. I mean, it's, uh, I do this professionally and it's hard to, to mm-hmm. keep up with things. I do think what I've seen among students and among, um, lay people around and priests and, when you've got catechism in one hand, and uh, I'm sorry, catechism and Bible going together and a deep prayer life, all of a sudden I've seen an evangelical zeal. People catch fire. I and, do too. And they're, I mean, it, it's a potent combination. Whereas if you if you only do the catechism, <laughs> if you only do doctrine, and again, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Maybe you can do that first, getting clear on things. Absolutely. I just think that the the it, it can become sterile and yeah. the kind of life giving force that yeah. this is real. This is true. This isn't something that was made up by a later medieval church. That I think is the temptation. We have to just explode yeah. and blow up. And I say this to, I criticize myself in this area, but I imagine there's a lot of listeners and viewers who are running to the same problem. We like to have our, I love to have my intellect tickled by reading Thomas Aquinas. Totally. I love philosophy. Yeah. Quite frankly, when I pick up the Bible, I find myself bored a lot of the yeah. time. Now, I'm embarrassed saying that, but I feel like it's good to be honest so you can do something about it. So do you know what that feels like to pick up the Bible and be bored? Or <sighs> you don't sound like you do. You sound like a- Well, but I, I, I've, I've been there. I, I, okay. I really had what, what do we do about that? <sighs> what do we do about that? Um, I think I, I think having good resources is, is a place to start just yeah. because the the, the 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 world of the Bible the world of biblical scholarship is is so it's a universe unto itself it's so no <laughs> yeah. it's got it's like walking into the bar scene at Star Wars right I mean it's like where, where am I right yeah. so if you're not careful that can, that can happen I think if you get the big picture get some good resources and you don't bite off too much at one time um, then be not afraid in, in the words of, of JP2 um, yeah, I, um, I also have this idea that people think they should feel a certain way mm. when they read scripture. <laughs> and so when they read scripture and do not have that feeling, they conclude that this was an unfruitful event. Like they feel like I, when I read scripture in the morning, I'm just going to feel inspired. Yeah. And if they don't feel it, they feel like they've failed and they stop reading the scriptures. I think that's been my case sometimes <sighs> in the past. Totally. And so now I find myself reading the scriptures out of duty and praying like holy maybe that's a big part of it too i think honest to god i think a lot of us we're kind of pract- we're kind of practical atheists like we're catholics and we are bloody all about the church's teaching on human sexuality and the sacraments right. and we can debate right. but it's like but do you believe that god loves you right right
right. And do you believe it's the inspired word of God? And, and, and part of what, what you bring to don't it. Don't say yes too quickly. That's what say, I want to say to someone. Yeah, no, I don't say yes too quickly. And in, in the, um, I mean, in terms of the, the Catholic view of the Bible of inspiration, and what I like to tell students that with, with like dogmas of the faith, often it, we communicate what the faith is not more clearly, but the faith itself is a mystery. So uh, we reject kind of a dictation theory where the, the, mm-hmm. the human author is like a robot and God, he just goes into a trance and God picks his arm up. That's not the faith at all. We also reject kind of a divine approval theory where the human author just goes and God says, oh, that'll do. I'll give it a stamp of approval. Okay. Uh, the, the mystery of the of scripture is it's human and divine. It's like the incarnation, uh, fully human, fully divine. Uh, but it's not. It, it, so I think when you get clear on what the faith is not, but then swim in the ocean of the mystery of what the faith is. When you when you believe this is the word of God, then you care about the details. Mm-hmm. That's been my experience. And, I, and I've, I've oscillated. I, mean, I remember being in the thick of grad school and you're doing this at a hyper academic level and it can become something that it, it's not right. Um, so it's the, it's the head and heart balance. Um, it's the, not just there and then, but the here and now it's, it's what God said and what God says mm. in the present. It's mm-hmm. a living word. Um, so it, it's not an easy issue, but uh, I really think if we're going to be Thomas, to be honest with you. I mean, like you look at St. Thomas, you look at like the beginning of the Summa, things he says, and his, he wrote commentaries on so many of the biblical books. He really, it can really be argued, right? I think rightfully so, that he was principally a biblical theologian. Amen. That he thinks the Summa is what you would have studied before you came to his Bible classes. And mm. so this was important, necessary, but propedeutic mm. for diving into scripture as like the holy of holies, because only scripture is divinely authored. No church document, no saint is, do we say, divine right. authorship. So I think if you just look at the witness of the saints, um, so there's a need to read scripture with good you know, tools, historical, linguistic, but also to read it on our knees, mm-hmm. to bring faith and reason together and to read it in light of faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even when we have questions, so I, 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 think, um, I think to back up from what we said earlier, to have a sense for where, what I like to do is in reading it canonically is really read it entirely in light of um, the ancient Jews of Jesus day just before and, and see Jesus, the climax, and even look back at the, like the stories of Genesis, um, the, the sacrifices to be really attentive to obviously how the fathers understood this, but how did the ancient Jews understand these things? So kind of a center of gravity with Jesus looking backward and looking forward, if that makes mm-hmm, sense, mm-hmm. that's helped me immensely. Okay. So you're not just trying to like reconstruct where it was eaten or something like that. Um, what did this mean to the ancient Jews and how does Jesus and Paul want me to see that in light of the fullness of reality in Jesus himself. Okay. I think once you, once you, once you kind of dig your heels in 200 BC, 280, and let that be the center of gravity yeah. backward and forward. That's been a powerful combination for me. That makes sense. Okay. So you've got different Bible studies. This one Romans has just come out. It might be helpful for those listening who want to love the Bible again, not maybe just jump into yeah. the big Bible study that Jeff right. put out. Is there, is there one like this that you would recommend? That's not going to take like eight months to get through necessarily. Or Yeah. I mean, it? The, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of great ones right now. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of great things. Uh, this was eight episodes, eight 30 minute episodes with uh, the uh, company. Yeah, that's com- easy. Eight episodes. They, You're going to give that to me, right? Well, you bet, man. Yes. They just, you know, like they essentially just so good at the aesthetics. They are good. And, they are very good. I have to say, at, look. not overwhelming. So I'd say with Romans, um, this is a, a letter that Catholics are often intimidated by because I think it's the, it's the Protestant letter. I mean, this is the letter that kicked off the Reformation. So famously Romans mm-hmm. 328, this is where Paul, uh, Martin Luther gets his doctrine of sola fide or Paul says you're saved by faith and not works of the law. Um, and we engage those questions. I mean, so here's where th- that phrase works. The law mm-hmm. shows up in a document that the Sea scrolls called 4 QMMT, the mix of my Torah. And, and that's the only two places in Galatians, Romans and there and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it seems to mean Jewish ritual uh, uh, works, it, calendar, uh, yeah, yeah. ceremonial. In other words, it doesn't seem to mean to be moral the Ten law. Commandments, right? Yeah. So, so we we dig up some of those things. Right. I would say too, when you get into Paul, um, especially Romans, what's Paul's gospel? It's a gospel of divine sonship. I, I think we sell we sell Christianity too short. We, we make it sound like it's a political or moral thing. Like just be a good boy scout or girl scout. It's like, no. How much of the divine life do you want to share in? Mm. Do you realize what God has done? And Paul gets this that it's becoming a son or a daughter in the Son, such that God the Father looked down upon you and upon me and love you and love me 
as he loves his only begotten son. I mean, that, that should give us Holy Ghost bumps, right? I mean, that, that's, that, that, it's just, I mean, that's, it's just crazy. But when you see a salvation, it's not just a divine acquittal. It's not just like get out of jail free. It's, yeah. it's like you've been adopted into the family. And even adoption, one of my heroes, uh, Matthias Shabin, I did my dissertation on him. It, 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 adoption doesn't even go far enough because it's the infusion. Divinization. It, it, it's a fusion of divine life. Exactly. Where you become a son or daughter in him. Um, I think our secular world needs to hear this. The, the, yeah, the moral law is part of being a Christian, but it's about union with Jesus. And when you yeah. say yes to Jesus, other no's follow. Just like when you said yes to your wife, other no's follow. Yes. But the no's are not first. It's It, it follows it, from the relationship. Totally. And you stop thinking minimalistically. Like, what's the bare minimum I got to do to avoid hell? It's like, how much of the divine life do you want? How much of your bride do you want? Yeah. All of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, that's beautiful. All right, one final question. Because we're going to wrap up and you're going to get an oh, Uber. Time's going too fast. <laughs> you're fantastic, here. dude. All right, one final question. How uh, how would you recommend people pray with the scriptures? Mm. And I know we kind of touched upon that, but as far as developing a prayer life and wanting to be more consistent, coming up with a prayer rule and these sorts of things, this is a very basic yeah. question. How would you advise people to begin doing that and maybe incorporate scripture into that prayer rule? Well, okay, so if I could just make two things at once. Um, kind of wise scripture. St. Ambrose has got a great line that we talk to God in our prayer and he talks to us in scripture. So on the one hand, there's many ways to, to, to receive the Lord's word to us, but there's kind of an, an objective sense, if you will, of reading scripture. I mean, so the Lord will give us locu- you know, locutions and things like that. Absolutely. But we're naive to think that we shouldn't read his holy word. Um, I, I'd, I'd say two things. One, I think men, with my college students I work with, um, mental prayer, that kind of quiet mm-hmm. prayer where, especially if you can before the Blessed Sacrament, it's not always possible, but where you're listening, uh, where you're really listening for the Lord's word for you and, and, and what needs to change in my life, where, where are you calling me? It's been said, I think rightfully so, that you can't persist in that kind of prayer and serious sin. Mm-hmm. The silence is too loud. Mm-hmm. Either you'll stop sinning or you'll stop praying, mm-hmm. but you can't do both for very long. So if you can, if you can muster 10, 20, 30 minutes of that, I, I, and I know we're busy. I love Jeff Caven's line. There's like, well, what are you making time for? Yeah. Right. Because the things that are most important to us, we make time for. And I will say it's easy to talk about God. It's easy to do the theology thing, talk ecclesial politics and this, that, and the other. But, yeah. but if you really believe, I'm talking to myself, if you really believe you would pray, you would pray. Prayer is a great act of belief. We have that phrase, are you practicing your faith? There's a sense in which if, you, if you're not practicing it, it's going to erode and wither. Uh, Lewis has got some great lines in mere Christianity that neither this belief nor any other will remain alive unless it's fed. Mm, and so That's I, great. So I, I think on the one hand, to make time for prayer where you're listening. I love that. I think with scripture, um, I can not take to not bite off too much at one time because yeah. I think when you just try to like read the whole thing, you, it becomes like a newspaper, right? Yeah, you're discouraged because yeah. you failed and you don't go back to it, and then. you don't go slow enough. Like the, the uh. think about the the humility of God's word. I think if we think of the incarnation, we think Caesar Augustus is coming. If we think of a God inspired book, we think like maybe Shakespeare, maybe Cicero. Yeah. We're not prepared for the grittiness. But what does Philippians say? That though he's in the form of God, he emptied himself, came on the form of a slave, even to the point of death, death on Christ. Therefore, God highly exalted him. So. Think about the humility of the word of God in the incarnation mm. and be prepared for the humility Ooh. of the word of God in sacred scripture, the I greatness like of it. That's great. And then what is the best Bible translation? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, the best one is the one you read. Good answer. <laughs> uh, every translate different translation philosophies. And I wouldn't get into like good or you know bad or good because it just depends on what ends, what goals you're trying to achieve. Right. So um, the, if it's, if it's a, 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 to study academically, you want as literal as you can, but it might be really clunky and awkward English. Right. So, <laughs> Uh, there's always a balance between that. The great adventure, we've got the RSVCE second edition, the one that Ignatius had, the maroon one. Um, and, and that's, that, that's, that's kind of a classic Catholic, uh, translation. Um, I, the, you know, there's, um, they all have, but well, you have like dynamic equivalence. And then what's the opposite of that? Well, kind of a, a, a literal, a literal. Uh, so the dynamic right. equivalence, what conveys the meaning like a new Jerusalem Bible. Right. Yeah. So, so the, and the problem is then you might, well, take our Passover example, right? Yeah. So, or, or I'll give you two examples. The Passover one where you might have the Greek word Pascha, but translators, when they think it's the lamb, will say Passover lamb mm-hmm. instead of just translate Passover. Gotcha. And then you don't realize the nuances mm-hmm. of the word Passover or take the word ach brother in Hebrew. Um, 
Um, like if you look at Genesis 13 and 14, you've got Lot, who is clearly Abraham's nephew, but it, most translations will just, this one included, okay. will describe him as, as Abraham's kinsman. Well, because yeah, they yeah, know yeah. he's not literally his brother, but the Hebrew is, we are Achim, we are brothers. Yeah. But then you don't know that brother is used more broad. So like in the gospels, when you see Jesus' brothers, well, if you have the Semitic backdrop, you realize, well, brother is used pretty broadly. It doesn't necessitate biological siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a literal translation would help you academically, gotcha. but it also might confuse you if you don't know what you're doing, because like, well, I thought I just read that he's his nephew. How can yeah, he be his yeah. brother? So, so if you're doing it more of a study, a literal translation would help. Yeah, but I, if, if you can't read that and you're much, you know, it, you feel more comfortable in New Jerusalem Bible, or even the message, goodness, I don't know, maybe not that one, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the best Bible translation is what you'll read. It's, 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 I like it's that. what you'll read. If you're trying to study to compare multiple ones is fine. But honestly, I, I, I mean, the Hebrew and the Greek, they're make, they're helpful, but they're also tools. So it's, it's a danger to think like that gives you unmitigated access to the word of God Ooh, because yeah. passages that are tricky in English, they tend to be tricky in Hebrew. So it's not magic. It's not yeah, like, you yeah. know, it's just one step closer, but it's not magic. So um, I, I honestly think if you have good resources, you'll be alerted to the nuances you need. Like, like the Passover thing I just mentioned, if it, 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 like with Scott Hahn or Petrie or Barber, there's, you know, Cavins, there's so many good resources out there. Get a hold of some good resources. Yeah, yeah, pray yeah. while you read, uh, read slow, take your time and, 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 and have the catechism in the hand and, and, and frequent the sacraments and let the whole thing kind of burn together Beautiful. and stay the course. Okay. Right, like you're gonna learn violin or whatever, which I'm not a musician, but um, you they know, they tell me it's difficult. Well, you get excited, right? <laughs> yeah. And then New Year's resolutions totally, stop by February, right? Yeah, stay the course, catch that second win, yeah, as an yeah, athlete, yeah, you know, and, and you, you'll feel the fruits of it. But, but it's not gonna be every time, it's not always gonna be riveting. But anything worth having in life, it doesn't come with sacrifice. Yeah, Why should this be different? Amen. Finally, where can people learn more about Andrew Swafford, your fantastic books here, the different works you're doing? Yeah, well, I, so I write for Ascension's uh, Bible blog uh, monthly, once or twice a month. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrew Ooh, underscore Swafford, and, okay. uh, uh, lowercase Andrew underscore Swafford. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, uh, Sarah Swafford, has a pretty thriving uh, ministry. Does. Sometimes hey, we Neil, speak together. Would you throw the airport into there for the Uber? Sure. Here, we're gonna get we're gonna multitask okay. so your Uber will come on time. Okay. Continue. Yeah, she has an amazing work. Yeah, so we, we we love to evangelize together. You know, one of the most powerful things that we did, um, I taught in Florence. We have a Benedict Nessa study abroad program in spring of twenty eighteen. We take we sent a professor over there, about fifty students every semester, and we got to kind of live really close quarters with these students, had my whole family over there. Yeah. And it was, you know, Benedict, we have great Benedictine students are amazing. Uh, but they also have their own I mean the same issues of the culture in fact infect all of us. And, yeah. and so uh, it really and we've always done this, but it really really, really lit a fire for us to kind of evangelize together. Cause it's been a lot of tag team work. You know, she That's speaks with the kids and vice versa. Yeah. Now we've got five at home. Um, but, uh, yeah. So speaking together or ministering to college students together, or even my oldest is 13. It's going to be 14 soon. I mean, um, they were some of our greatest evangelists. The combination of kind of normal, but different yeah. with a student or the kids or us, uh, you know, people take notice. Awesome. We just booked your Uber. Look at that. Look how hey, efficient. Great to see you, Thank you so much for being here. Super great of you. I know you got up super early. Did you have to take off school for this? <laughs> I did. You know, I did. I actually, when I originally, I thought we were on spring break, but spring break for us is next week. So my students are oh, happy. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're pretty happy about it. Okay. Well, good. Well, thanks so much. Uh, man, I, I just thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. And thank you for all your ministry, whether it, whether it's the, the porn stuff or all the other apostolates, the apologetics, the just getting the Catholic faith out. I mean, you are an incredible witness. So thank you for thank your work. Thank you. All right. God bless. God bless. All right. We're going to take a pause from this fantastic discussion with Dr. Swafford and if you want to watch the post show wrap up bit of this video go to patreon.com slash mattfrad to watch the rest of this discussion by the way we do this with all of the discussions we have we always have these post show wrap up clips that are available just to our patrons if you want to become a patron go to patreon.com slash mattfrad in addition to all those uh, post show wrap up videos you'll get things like this pints with Aquinas beer stein signed books stickers an exclusive audio library, and much else besides. And it really helps us do this work we're doing. Patreon.com slash Matt Frad. Thanks.